Today represents a first for me. After a 25-year career, this is the first time I've ever worn a sports jacket in a professional setting. How does it look? I bought this thing on Friday. And when you buy a sports coat from the store, you know, they sell these things to anybody. They're not made for you. And the sleeves came all the way down to my knuckles. And my wife realizing that I was not going to have enough time to get it tailored, she's like, it looks fine. <laughs> and I'm standing in the mirror, <laughs> feeling like I was a seven-year-old wearing his father's jacket. And I got desperate. On Sunday, I'm Googling for someone that can do alterations. And all I see is closed, closed, opens on Tuesday. And I'm like, I don't have a chance. And about 15 miles away from my home, there was a person that was open till nine. And I'm a little worried that, why are you open till nine on a Sunday? Aren't you busy all week that you need time off? There's a reason <laughs> why he's open when no one else is. But I had to take my chances. So I get in my car. Before getting in our car, I did call and I said, hey, how much and how long to tailor a men's suit, sports coat? He was like a week. And I was like, I need it much sooner than that. He said, two days. And I said, you're getting close. <laughs> I need it today. He was like, ah, you got to pick it up by, by four. So I drove down there and he told me $20. I'm really getting nervous now. And I pull up and it's a house in a normal neighborhood. No storefront, no fancy signage, and he opened the door with no shoes on. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not getting this suit back <laughs> if I leave it here. <laughs> but you only live once. So I walk in and I saw the sewing machines in the corner, so I'm like, all right, it's getting a little legit. I see other garments waiting to be tailored. Maybe I am in the right place. And he hung it up on a string hanging from the ceiling. And it twirled around. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he asked me to put the jacket on. And I was like, what do you think? He was like, yeah, you definitely need to take it down an inch or so. And so I leave the jacket with him. And I come back. And I put the jacket on. And here's the thing. The name of this place is Sonny and Linda's Alterations. That's his American name. He didn't speak English that well, and he did his best to make me feel comfortable. I put the jacket on, and that's when I learned that language is universal. Watch how I use it. Silence and a smile is the same in every language. And I put this jacket on, and it reminded me something. We live in a fairly open society where I can buy a jacket that wasn't quite made for me, and he possessed the skill through open knowledge to tailor it for my exact needs. In the software world, we call this patches or features or bug fixes, but he made it perfect just for me. And I smiled and I gave him $60, and he was so happy. The first thing he said, this is too much money. It's only $20. I said, you can keep it. The jacket's perfect. And he smiled like a child. And he held the $60 close to his chest. He said, I'm taking the family out to dinner tonight. And the world is filled with these hidden maintainers. No one really knows their names. They don't work for a big, fancy company. But they do their best to make sure that we get to use the things that work for us. All those bug fixes, all those GitHub issues, there's a silent league of maintainers out here doing that kind of work, tailor fitting our software for our own needs. When we think about what it takes to deliver on some of this software, I think we're in this really pivotal point because open source has been such this powerful thing that we sometimes, I think, take it for granted. It's tricky. I want you to go through a thought experiment. Imagine if you had been diagnosed with an untreatable disease, not even curable, untreatable. 
And so you decide to dedicate your entire life work to this disease. And the good news is you don't have to start from scratch. You get to rely on previous science. You get to use very mature machines, microscopes. You get to read all the research papers that became before you. And then you find a solution. You've done it. You can finally save yourself. You have to make a pivotal decision. Do you keep this formula for yourself? Or do you decide to share with other people? Now, there is no right answer here. Because why not capitalize on all the value that you've just now introduced to the world? Isn't it only fair that you get to capitalize from this? And I'm pretty sure some of you in the audience would be like, who in their right mind would miss out on an opportunity to make billions of dollars from their own invention? Well, if you look around the room here today, those people are sitting next to you. Think about some of these global projects that we have that the very same maintainers could have easily chosen to start a company and go the proprietary route and keep it all for themselves. But instead, they chose to open source and stand behind those projects and make it available to all. It's a very tricky place to be, and I don't think there's a perfect answer for this. So I have a lot of empathy with companies contributors and maintainers that are struggling with, how long can I do this for? We hear about open source sustainability, but I'm not quite sure people understand what this means. I've been an open source contributor for a while, and there's this saying, um, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room, and you should leave. But eventually, if we all did that, then the room would be empty. And when I got into open source, those smart people didn't leave the room. They chose to collaborate instead. They even made a seat for me. I sat down, didn't know what I was doing, didn't know how to contribute, didn't know the workflow process. But they figured out a way to make it so, the documentation, the code reviews. This is what happens when the smart people stay in the room. So one day, I got to return the favor. I remember I open sourced my first project, CompD. It wasn't super popular, but it did make its way around the world. I remember going to an open source conference in Europe, a conference called FOSDEM, and I'm standing in the back of this room, and there is someone that I don't know that was given a presentation about CompD. They had all of these wonderful things to say. I'm in the back just smiling my ass off. <laughs> I'm not quite famous, but people know who I am, or at least they're aware of the work that I do. And they went on to tell the audience of how it was so important that I chose not only to scratch my own itch, but I also helped them with theirs. And I felt really good about that project. And so as a maintainer, I went home and said, let me add more features. Let me fix a few bugs. I'm now more motivated than ever. You gotta be careful when you're a maintainer motivated to that degree because you can hide burnout underneath the cloth of success. It's really easy to do. And I remember there was a time when I said no for the first time. See, what CompD does, it takes data from key value stores like etcd, a database. And there was a new company on the scene. They've been around for a while called HashiCorp. I had been a contributor to HashiCorp, and they've contributed to my project CompD. What's supposed to happen? And one day, they introduced a new product called Vault. And I said, hey. I have no interest as a maintainer integrating with that product. But for them, this was a very important product. And they would like Comte to support it because at this point, Comte had become somewhat popular. And they were recommending it to their community. But here I was saying no. So when you say no as a maintainer, something has to give. How do we resolve issues when there's a conflict or a difference of opinion? Well, in this scenario, they chose to make another project, a clone of mine. And if you're a maintainer, you realize that at the top of that GitHub repository, there's the fork button. Anyone can click it and settle disputes without any arguments. And I woke up one day, and they had a new project called Console Template. And they posted it. 
and it was at the top of Hacker News, and I'm sitting there, smiling. But the internet can't see that. So in my defense, this thing rises to the top spot on Hacker News. How dare big evil HashiCorp take Kelsey's work and rebrand it as their own? They should have just contributed back. There was no need for a competing project. And I'm reading this as like, oh, they don't understand what has happened. When you get to the point where you can influence someone else to produce something else, this is also an achievement. And so I replied, this is open source. This is what's supposed to happen. Do you think that I did all of this work by myself? They were some of the largest contributors. I didn't invent the programming language that CompD is written in. I didn't invent the operating system that CompD is written in. If you zoom out, we've been in this together this whole time. And so I applaud the efforts for this new project to exist. And I'm quite flattered that this larger company decided to take inspiration from me. And I will go on to speak at a number of their conferences because that's what good community members do. Even when we compete, we still find rooms to collaborate. And I remember one time I was collaborating with that particular company, HashiCorp, and I'm doing this keynote. And they gave me one of their HashiCorp shirts. My last name is Hightower, and their logo has this wonderful H. And I put it on, so the H stands for Hightower. And I wore it proudly on that keynote stage. And I remember having this shirt on. After the final keynote that I gave, they did a company-wide picture. At this point, HashiCorp grows to about, I don't know, three to 400 people. And they all line up on the stage, and we take photos. And they're like, one of the founders, Mitchell Hashimoto, Kelsey, get in the photo. You're like family. So I get into the photo, and I stand there, and I pose with my H on. And I straighten it out just so it looks perfect. And we take the photo. And I was like, Mitchell, this is our chance to do the funniest thing ever. It's like, what do you have in mind? And he posts a photo on Twitter. And as the CEO and founder of HashiCorp, he wrote, I'm so happy that Kelsey is joining HashiCorp. <laughs> now, as an executive myself at Google, this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I let it bake for hours. The HR department is like, what's going on? When did Kelsey leave? <laughs> when you work with almost 200,000 people, no one knows what's going on. So people were emailing me like, congratulations, I think. <laughs> and you just start typing, but never send anything. So it's just dot, dot, <laughs> dot. <laughs> so after a couple of hours, because it started getting really serious, and you know it's serious when your VP puts a meeting on your calendar to discuss things. So I declined the meeting, I was like, it's a joke. <laughs> and I responded, but HashiCorp is like family. And I remember during that time, I had this phrase, different company, same team. That's how I've always thought about this open source collaboration. And I've contributed to many of the HashiCorp projects. And the reason why I'm bringing up HashiCorp in particular, because I have a lot of empathy for my family and what they go through. I also advise lots of startups, and they all have this sentiment that seems to be pretty new. From the outsider's view, the early days of open source seemed to try to make better versions of things that existed already. Some of the earlier operating systems, corn shell to bash, there was a blueprint and a template. And the goal was to turn proprietary software and make it open. And of course, they got better over time to the point where they became industry standards. But imagine trying to build a company in this era. This is an extreme amount of challenge. If you're a small company or a startup, how do you sell something that you give away completely for free? I don't have a perfect answer for that. I don't think the answer is changing your license. That's not going to work, folks. You're going to have to do something better than that. You're going to have to do something just like my tailor did. You're going to have to figure out how to offer value in an open ecosystem. Because if you don't, Someone else will figure out a way to do it instead. The question I'd like to leave with all the founders and customers out there that are struggling with this, 
we have to ask ourselves, what is the moat that they need to build? And my response to that is, why are you trying to build a moat in the age of flight? That is not a sustainable path. We're going to have to figure out how to collaborate on equal terms. Now, a lot of you are going to go out and enjoy the next two days of this conference, and I want to leave you with one more phrase. When you're thinking about whether you should contribute or not, whether you should try that new idea and make it open, one phrase that I always return to in moments like this is, there are some people that have ideas, and there are some ideas that have people. And don't forget that last part. Thank you.